Let's uh, just bow in prayer, first of all, and ask God's blessing. Father, we bow before you in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and through his blood poured out for our sins upon the cross of Calvary, without which we have no access to you. And we thank you for your grace, your love, your mercy, all the blessings that you've given us in him. And now, Father, we want to look into your word, and we would take your word very reverently and carefully, and we would desire to obey it and to live it as you reveal it to us. So we pray, Lord, that by your Holy Spirit you will speak to us and show us your will for our lives and the purpose that you have in prophecy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like you to open your Bibles, first of all, this morning to Isaiah 46. And we're going to read from verse 9. I'll probably mostly be quoting scriptures. We won't take time to turn to most of them, but let's look at this one. God is speaking. Well, let's, um, since we're right here, let's just look at the chapter before. <clears throat> Verse 18, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself, that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. You know, that's a occultism. Uh, the word occult means hidden. And there are people who are going around with secret ideas, and you can join this secret organization and get in on something that nobody else knows. God says, I don't deal that way. Uh, what I say is open, and it's for all to know who are willing to hear. And then he, <clears throat> go down to verse 21. Tell ye, and bring them near, yea, and let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I, the Lord, he's talking about foretelling the future. Have not I, the Lord, and there is no God be else beside me, a just God and a Savior. <clears throat> there is none beside me. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. This is a statement, amazingly, in the Old Testament that he is the God who saves everybody, not just the Jews. He is the Savior. And you'll find this, and we don't take time to turn to it, but a number of times in chapter 43, uh, 44, 45, and so forth. We'll just give you one verse and go back to 43 and uh, verse 10. <clears throat> And we will come back to this verse. Ye are my witnesses. He's talking to Israel. Saith the Lord and my servant whom I have chosen that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he before me there was no God formed neither shall there be after me. Of course that does away with Mormonism. I don't know how familiar you are with Mormonism but when Jesus prayed our Father who art in heaven he also has a grandfather in heaven and a great grandfather and a great 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 grandfather and every Mormon hopes to become a god every male. The ladies can only become goddesses and they look forward to eternal pregnancy uh, in heaven because they have to people another planet, you know, and there will be another <clears throat> Adam, another Eve, another Lucifer, another fall, another Jesus, another redemption. This has been going on forever. And uh, <clears throat> of course if you tell a Mormon that they say, oh no, we only deal with the God of this world. Uh, that's the name of Satan, you know, and indeed that is their God, the God of this world. But they have an infinite number of gods. They've got more gods than the Hindus. The Hindus only have about 330 million. The Mormons have more than that. <clears throat> because this has been going on forever. But this God says, before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be any after me. Okay? That finishes it. <clears throat> you can't have any more gods. I mean, he is called the Most High, right? How many Most Highs can you have? Well, you can only have one Most High. 
Yeah, so you know that Lucifer was badly deceived when he said, I will be like the Most High. You just can't do it. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. <coughs> Pardon me. Verse 11 is a very important verse. I, even I, am the Lord. That's Yahweh, Jehovah. And beside me there is no Savior. You understand that? God is the Savior. We read it, look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, there is none else. Well, what does that mean then? If Jesus is the Savior, he must be God, right? And when Jesus, I'm getting ahead of myself, because there are two main uh, subjects of prophecy that we want to talk about, Israel and the Messiah, who would come through Israel. And when Jesus said, I and my Father are one, he didn't mean one in purpose, one in interest, one in work, and so forth, like the Jehovah's Witnesses or, or the Mormons or some of the cultists would say. He meant one in essence. If Jesus isn't God, he can't be the Savior, right? Because the Bible says that God is the only Savior. This is the God of the Old Testament, Jehovah speaking, and there is no Savior but me, I myself. So then what does it say in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government will be upon his shoulders, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, what? The Mighty God. Oh, Jehovah's Witness will say, oh, that's a mighty God, but not Almighty God. <clears throat> well, there's about 37 verses in the Old Testament where Jehovah says that he's Mighty God. I mean, how many gods can you have? If he's God, he's God. Uh, I, I'm getting off my topic here <laughs> for a moment, but if, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses love John 1.1 1, 1, because there, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. We have it spelled with a big G. And they have, it's not a translation, uh, they don't know how to translate the Bible. There's no uh, Greek scholar that would translate it like that, but they say, and the Word was a God, a little God. So all you have to do with Jehovah's Witness, that's their favorite verse. The word was a God, a little God. Wait a minute, how many gods are there? One God. Well, then let's count the gods in this verse. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, spelled with a big G. Uh, that, that's God number one, right? And the word was a God, spelled with a little g. That's God number two. For all your talk about one God, you got two gods. Well, now, who is this little God? Well, that's Jesus. Well, is, well he, is he a false God? Oh, no. <laughs> they would never say Jesus was a false God. So you got two gods. you got a big God and a little God. You can't have it. <clears throat> it's not possible. And God of the old, the Bible is consistent all throughout. And he says, I'm God. Before me there was no God formed. After me there's no God formed. Is there a God beside me? He says, I don't know of any. <laughs> If God, who is infinite in knowledge, doesn't know of any other gods, you can be sure there are no... Oh, wait a minute, there are some other gods, spelled with a little g. But they're false gods, right? The true God and false gods. Okay, he is the only Savior, but uh, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. What's, what does it say next? The Everlasting Father. The babe that was born in Bethlehem is indeed the father. When Jesus said, I and my father are one, he meant one in essence. When he used the words, I am, he used them in a way you wouldn't dare to use them. He said, I am. What? The door. I am the bread of God that came down from heaven. I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness. Before Abraham was what? Not I was, I am. Those are the very, that's the very name of God with which he revealed himself to Moses. Well, getting ahead of myself, because we wanted to come back and talk about, about Christ. Now, <clears throat> Verse 23, back to chapter 45. I have sworn by myself the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that unto me. Every knee shall bow, 
every tongue shall swear. What does Philippians chapter 2 say? At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, and every tongue will acknowledge that he is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Well, I didn't come here to defend the Trinity for you this morning. <clears throat> um, you know, we have a, a great oneness teaching. Uh, the United Pentecostal Church, for example, and they deny Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I won't get into that. But if you want a good verse for them, well, they'll say the Father is an office or a mode of, you know, it's an old heresy. Uh, the Son is an office, and, and, and uh, the Holy Spirit, you know, that's one of the ways in which God manifests himself. You mean, it says the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. You mean an office sent another office, you know, um, but, but let's go to uh, uh, John chapter 8, where Jesus says that the, the Jews, don't turn to it. We don't have time to turn to it. I'll just quote it. But <clears throat> the Jews said, because in John 5, Jesus had said, look, I don't bear witness of myself. If I bear witness of myself, my witness isn't true. And then in chapter 8, they say, the Jews say, you're bearing witness of yourself. And Jesus says, wait a minute, the testimony of two witnesses is valid according to your law, right? There is one who bears witness of me, that's the Father, and I bear witness, that's two of us. Tell that to the oneness people. Uh, he says there are two who are bearing witness, okay? Anyway, by the way, since we're on that topic, uh, just uh, this book is an amazing book, this Bible. Um, before we get to where we wanted to get to, we haven't got to that yet. Um, uh, turn over to chapter 48, verse 15. You want to see the Trinity in the Old Testament? <clears throat> the Trinity is all through the Old Testament. Wow, we don't have time to talk about that. I wish we could. Um, you see, okay, I'm getting off the topic again here. But look, let's get down to business. Uh, there are three basic concepts of God. This is God who's revealing himself to us. On the one hand, you've got the oneness people that I talked about. Well, let's, for, let's take them second. On the one hand, you have um, a belief in polytheism. Many gods, right? You know who invented that? Satan. I quoted the verse to you. He said, I will be like the Most High. I said, how many Most Highs can you have? Only one. In one stroke, Satan turned monotheism. Now, don't confuse that with monism. Monism is the belief that all is God, okay? That's pantheism. Uh, he, he turned monotheism, one God, into polytheism, many gods, right? He said, I will be like God. And then he comes down and he tells Eve, you can be like God. So now suddenly we did away with, with one God, we got many gods, all right? Now, there's the belief in many gods, okay? You know, I, I said the Hindus have many gods. The Greeks, the Romans, they had many gods. Paul, Acts 17, he's in Athens and he says, you got all these altars, all of these gods. And you even have an altar to the unknown God in case you overlooked one. <laughs> and Paul says, that's the one who's the true God. Now, let me tell you a bit about him. So. Polytheism has some problems. It has diversity, but it has no unity. You must have both. It has diversity, but no unity. There's no God who can pull the whole thing together. They, they fight wars with one another. The gods, remember, the gods of the Greeks and the Romans, they steal one another's wives. There's no peace in heaven. There can be no peace on earth. You got nothing to pull, pull this thing to unify this thing together. On the other hand, you have the teaching of Allah, one God, okay? Denies the Trinity, denies that Jesus is God. Uh, Vatican II, the Catholic Church teaches that Allah is the same as the God of the Bible. Not true, folks. <laughs> he is one, he is a single individual, and that's what a lot of Jews think Jehovah is. A single individual, that's why they reject the Trinity. They didn't understand their, their own scriptures. Now, what's the problem over here? 
uh, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and so forth. You've got unity but no diversity. <clears throat> what do I mean by that? Before Allah created any human beings, he, he was incomplete. He could not experience love. He couldn't experience communion. He couldn't experience fellowship. He was all alone. <laughs> unity but no diversity. The Bible presents a God who is one, but three persons. God existed eternally in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They commune together. They fellowship together, complete. They don't need us for anything, okay? Now, and you see them in communion right here. Isaiah 48, verse 15. I, even I, have, have spoken. Wait a minute. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, verse 15, I, even I, have spoken. This is the same God that we're going to read about back in chapter 46. I have called him. I have brought him. He shall make his way prosperous. Come ye near unto me. Hear ye this. I have not spoken <clears throat> in secret. From the beginning, from the time that it was, there am I. Now, who is that? That's God. He's been around forever. He's the one who speaks. He's the Logos. Okay? He's the Word that you read of in John 1.1. 1, 1. What does it say? And now the Lord God and His Spirit hath sent me. Do you see that? We've got one who's God. He's been speaking from the beginning. But he says, the Lord God and His Spirit have sent me. Okay? You've got Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You've got... They are in communion, and he has, and, and one of them who is God has been sent by another one who is God and who is the Spirit of God, okay? But let's go back finally, wow, after all this time, to the verse we wanted. And it was quoted or read last night, <clears throat> verse 9 of 46. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Now, We've read, he said various things about himself. Now he's saying something very significant. Verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. God says, I'm the God of prophecy. And I tell what's going to happen before it happens. And I watch over history to make sure it happens exactly as I said it. And that's how you can know that the Bible is the Word of God. You will not find prophecy, but I, I'm, I get excited about prophecy. About 25% of this book is prophecy. It is a neglected subject today. Let me tell you one of the ways in which it is neglected. <clears throat> how did Paul preach the gospel? He went into the synagogue. Again, we won't take time to turn to it. Maybe we sh I wish we could take time to turn to it. It would be better that you could just see it yourself. But you know how Acts 17 begins. Paul, it says, as his manner was, went in unto the synagogue and reasoned with them three Sabbath days out of the scriptures. What scriptures was that? The Old Testament scriptures. They didn't have the New Testament at that time, right? opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and that this Jesus that I speak unto you is the Christ. You see his modus operandi? You see how he presented the gospel? Just turn to, uh, um, well, well, I guess we don't need to hold our finger back there in Isaiah anymore. Turn to Romans chapter 1 and notice what he says. <clears throat> so we can all see it for ourselves here. Paul, Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Who called him? <clears throat> Jesus called him. Wow, I could get off on another tangent. This man, Paul, is fantastic. He was a rabbi. He hated the Christians. He persecuted them. He threw them in prison. He had them killed. And suddenly, he's a Christian. Hey, something happened to him 
that was real. He said he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. His life was transformed. And he didn't have to go up to, I'm sorry, uh, we have any Catholics here, I don't want to offend you, but he didn't have to go to Rome and check it out with the magisterium. He didn't have to check it out with the Congress of Cardinals. Uh, you know, he didn't even go to Peter, it says. He says, I didn't go to Peter. I didn't go to those who were apostles before me. He went out in the Arabian Desert, and in Galatians chapter 1, he says, I certify you. I happen to be a CPA, so I know what certification means. I certify you, brethren, the gospel that I preached is not of man. I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it by any man, but by revelation from Jesus Christ himself. And he wrote more of the New Testament than any of the other apostles. He reproved Peter, who was an apostle. In, in 1 Corinthians 11, he tells you what happened at the Last Supper, and he wasn't even there. And he says, I received of the Lord that which I also de delivered unto you, that the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and so forth and so on. He got the whole thing from Jesus Christ, okay? <clears throat> not of man. He's not ordained of men. And if you're not called by God, whatever men may say is not going to be of any, any benefit. So Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. I hey, wait a minute, you're offending my religion. Well, if it's your religion, you got problems. This is the gospel of God. This is the gospel of this God who said he's the savior. There is no God beside me and he's got a gospel. Wait a minute, Christianity isn't something that somebody invented lately. It comes from the Old Testament. So what does he say? Which he promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power, with authority, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Nobody else did that. So... He says, look, here's what the prophet said about the gospel. We go about this wrong. I'm sorry. Well, let me tell you what happened to me. Now, I was a very bad person, and I was involved in drugs. Well, that's fine. Okay. But I met Jesus, and so forth and so on. And sometimes we push these people forward before they're even ready. They don't even know anything. And they fall flat on their face. They're a great rock star, this somebody or other, you know. Uh, I call it Christianity Today. Wow, you want to know who's a Christian? Why that macho quarterback that threw that 65-yard touchdown pass that won the Super Bowl in the last three seconds? He's a Christian! <laughs> Fantastic! Isn't that amazing? And that beautiful actress, well, she's played some shady roles, but she's been on the 700 Club giving her testimony. Isn't that great? Wow! <laughs> you know, you can be a Christian and really hold your head up and you can just, <laughs> you can get everything the world wants and you can do it all in the name of Jesus. Woo. That's not Christianity. I'm sorry. You know what the kind of Christianity Jesus talked about? In John 15, he said, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. The servant isn't greater than his Lord. If they killed me, what do you think they're going to do to you if you are true to me? And Paul, well, he did give his testimony uh, to Agrippa and so forth that he met Jesus. But it was more than just a testimony. It, it was a bit more powerful than the testimonies that we have today. But he preached the gospel this way. He said, look what the prophet said. This isn't something we invented lately. Saved. People say, saved, where do you get that idea? We read it. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, there is none else. Paul counted himself among the saved in, in 1 Corinthians 1.18. He says, unto them that perish, this gospel is foolishness but unto us who are saved. 
It's the power of God. There are saved people and lost people, and it's not a new invention of some late comers on the, on the religious scene. You understand what I'm trying to say? Prophecy. It's the very heart of the message. It's who, how God identifies himself. And we need to tie it into the gospel. And we need to confront people with the God of prophecy and with prophecy fulfilled. And they cannot escape the evidence. Now, how, what are you going to say to an atheist who says, uh, who asks you, well, prove that God exists. Well, you could say, prove he doesn't exist. Uh, how about proving the absurd scenario that everything, including the human brain, began with a big bang 18 billion years ago, and it's all been going on from now. We're just stimulus response mechanisms, you know. <laughs> and, and the words that I'm speaking are simply the, the results of the antecedent motions of the atoms in my brain. It all began. <laughs> Come on. <clears throat> but, but you're not going to get anywhere by arguing like that. And the Bible doesn't even try to do it. Philosophers have been trying to come up with a philosophical proof for the existence of God. Forget it, he's infinite. He's beyond us. Finite beings could neither prove nor disprove that God exists. But God can communicate himself to you. I mean, do you have to prove that your wife exists? Do you have to prove you exist? You can't even prove it philosophically. Okay? Well, don't you think God can communicate himself? He says, you will seek for me and find me when you seek for me with all your heart. Seek for the true God, not a cosmic bellhop in the sky that will give you what you want. You know, that's what prayer is for most people who call themselves Christians, a religious technique for getting what they want, right? We set our sights on what we want and spend the sweet hour of prayer trying to talk God into working it out for us. And if somebody comes along and offers you a special technique, if you visualize, or if you speak these positive words, or if you think these positive thoughts, then you will get what, hey, you've become God. A lot of Christians think faith is if I could just believe that what I'm praying for will happen. I bet you a lot of you today think that's faith. If I could just, I'm praying for something, now if I can just believe it'll happen. That's not faith. If you can make something happen because you believe it will happen, you don't need God. That's the power of the mind. The power of positive thinking. Faith is believing God will make it happen. Ooh, wait a minute. That introduces a new factor into the equation. Well, how could you possibly believe that God would make it happen unless you know it's God's will? And we're back to prophecy. What's the purpose of prophecy? If God created human beings, he's going to have to have prophecy. They're going to rebel. They're going to disobey. Their will will conflict with his will. He's got to tell them what's wrong. He's got to tell them some consequences. He's got to tell them the future. And, he's going, and so God demonstrates his existence by prophecy. And that was the modus operandi of Paul, of the apostles. That was the way they preached the gospel. And we better get back to it today. It is powerful really powerful. So, God gives this irrefutable evidence of his existence, a personal God. He foretells the future. What does that tell us? It tells us that history has meaning. It tells us it's not just the meaningless flux of the atoms. It's not just uh, what man is trying to do to build a utopia on this earth. God is behind history. Well, not everything that happens, obviously. He's not behind the rape and the murder and the rebellion and the, and the rejection. Uh, I hope you don't think that. Uh, don't, uh, well, I don't want to get off into Calvinism. I'm sure we have some Calvinists here. But don't get, because it says in, in Ephesians chapter 1, he is the God who works all things according to the purpose of his own will. Don't then think that everything that happens is God's will. Obviously it isn't. Man is in rebellion, but God has a purpose, and he tells you beforehand what's going to happen, and he warns. It's another reason for prophecy, is to warn about the future, to warn of the consequences, and if you do this, this will happen. 
It shows that he knows the future in advance. Only God can do that. It shows that he can influence the future without destroying man's will. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, what did he say? To the Jews, he indicted them with the, with the death of Jesus. He says, him being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by wicked hands and crucified and slain the Lord of life and glory. They did it, but God knew it was going to happen, and he foretold it. We'll come back to that. Uh, wow, we've got to move fast if we have time. So, <clears throat> there are problems if God's going to give us prophecy. Well, he lays it all out, so people try to frustrate it. He tells you exactly what's going to happen, and so the rebels try to make it not happen so they can prove God doesn't exist. So he gives it to us in mystery form. Not easy to know prophecy. Daniel 12, verse 10 says, The wise will understand, but the wicked won't. You have to be in touch with God. You have to know the word of God. Not just a superficial... <coughs> <clears throat> Pardon me. Not just a superficial knowledge of the Bible. You need to know the Word of God well, so that when somebody says something, instantly you know that is not what God said. That is not the teaching of His Word. You know, one of the uh, one of the um, marks that Jesus gave of the last days. We won't have time to get into this, but one of the major marks that Jesus gave of the last days was what? False prophets. False prophets. Interesting. It's not all he said. He said in the last days many false prophets will arise and will deceive many 1900 years ago, Jesus said, you want to know what the last days will be characterized? You know, if you and I had, had been asked this 100 years ago, and we had some insight into the future science and so forth, we'd say, oh, I'll tell you what it'll be like in the last days. Atheism, skepticism, science will, will be so advanced. We'll have computers. We'll have men on the moon. Nobody will believe in God any, anymore. We would have been wrong, right? Jesus said, you want to know what's going to characterize the last days? An explosion of interest in religion, in the spiritual, but false. Beware. And he was right. False prophets. Do we have false prophets today? You know, I might offend you if I start to name some of them. We've got a lot of false prophets. Unfortunately, uh, we had to have Diane Sawyer uh, make an expose on some of them. A few years ago, it was Randy the Magician, uh, who, you know, we had Peter Popoff. Fantastic what he could do. He could call out names and addresses, name of your doctor, your ailment, and call people forward. All of this getting a revelation from God. So Randy the Magician, you've got to give him credit. I, mean, I was about ready to expose Peter Popoff myself, but Randy beat me to it. Uh, he took a team, you know the story, he took a team into these huge conventions with thousands of people there, and they brought in a sophisticated little device for scanning the radio waves, and what do you know? They found God's voice at 49.7 megahertz. <laughs> and, and it sounded very much like his wife backstage. <laughs> and she would begin every evening, do you hear me, darling? If you don't, we're in trouble. Uh, it's the one in the red dress, over to the right, yeah, with, no, with the gray hair, back a little farther, you know. He's getting it in a little sophisticated listening device in his ear, transmitted from backstage, and they've got all the data. And thousands, I would say hundreds of thousands of Christians fell for this, people who call themselves Christians. False prophets? I could name quite a few more. I'm going to really offend you. Pastor maybe won't let me speak here tomorrow morning, I don't know. Uh, but let's take Oral Roberts. Look, let's be honest, folks. Don't hold up a man and don't hold me up. And this is a man who says that a 900-foot Jesus talked to him for seven hours <laughs> and gave him a commission 
to build the city of faith, a hospital in Tulsa, Oklahoma, that any child would know wasn't needed, right? It sits today bankrupt and empty, a monument to a false prophet. Oh, he thought he had a deal uh, a few weeks ago with a secular company was going to buy it. What do you know? They moved the praying hands, those giant praying hands, over onto Oral Roberts University. I'm sorry, folks. People don't like me to name names. But let's be straight on this. We have false prophets, and if I make false prophecies, you ought to call me on it. And I think it was Hal Lindsey last night uh, said that uh, if you did to some of these people, today what they did in the Old Testament, they'd make a big pile of stones because they got stoned at that time. Now let's acknowledge when somebody makes a false prophecy, let's acknowledge that it's a false prophecy. And he said God told him that there would be miracles that would take place there. And science and faith would create miracles, a cure for cancer and so forth. And you know that he told you that God was going to kill him unless he got $8 million and he was going to use it for scholarships for medical students, right? Not a dime of it was used for that, okay? All right, let's just be honest about it. There are false prophets, false prophecies. Uh, the Bible gives a number of criteria, a number of measurements by which you can judge a false prophet. Deuteronomy 13, and, and we won't take time to turn to it. You can look them up in your leisure. He says, if a prophet comes forth and he gives a sign that comes to pass. Wait a minute. False prophets can give a sign and it comes to pass? Yes. Just because it seems miraculous doesn't mean it's true. It doesn't mean it's of God. And you've got Richard Roberts at Robert Tilton's Word of Faith World Outreach Center is what it was called in those days. And he's got the whole audience repeating after him, when you see a miracle, that proves it. Hey, they're being set up for the great miracle worker who will come with lying signs and wonders and all deceivableness, all the power of Satan, just because it seems to be a miracle doesn't mean it's of God, right? And so in Deuteronomy 13, he says, you've got somebody who does it, seems to do a miracle, he gives a sign, it even comes to pass, but he leads you to follow other gods. That's a false prophet. You're not to be afraid of him, you're not to follow him. We've got people leading people after false gods. Okay? We got Norman Vincent Peale. My gracious. On the Phil Donahue show, he said he found eternal peace in the Shinto shrine. He said, you don't have to be born again. You got your way to God. I got my way to God. He says this on national television. He's published in the newspaper saying the virgin birth isn't necessary. You don't need the virgin birth. You don't need the new birth. I could go on and on about this man, a false prophet, who, by the way, is the founder of Christian psychology. He was the man who first tried to put theology and psychology together, and the whole church stood against him for 50 years, and now they're all following him. Norman Vincent Peale, who says, just as there are scientific methods for tapping the energy in the atom, so there are scientific methods for releasing spiritual power. That's Christian science. That's mind science. You turn God into his cosmic energy source. No, we're going to come to God not on scientific methods where we can make it happen. But we're going to come to God as repentant sinners crying out to him for his mercy and his grace. And if it pleases him, he will answer our prayers and you don't have any technique for making it happen. Why then does God allow these false prophets to make these things, these signs kind of pass? He says it in Deuteronomy 13, to test you, to see whether you will follow me, to see whether you want your ears to be tickled, whether you, people say, oh yeah, I'm seeking God. Wait a minute. God says, if you seek me, you will find me. A lot of people claim they're seeking God and they don't find him. Why? They're seeking a God that they want, a God that they can manipulate, a God who will give them what they want. 
They're not seeking a God who's going to say, thus saith the Lord, you have sinned. You are worthy of eternal hell. Repent. That's not a popular message. We want something positive today. Uh, you know, I was being interviewed by one of these positive people on Christian television, uh, Christian radio. They don't ask me back. And, uh, and he said, you know what? I think the Bible is the foremost positive mental attitude book in the world. Norman Vincent Peale and Robert Schuller say the same thing. Positive thinking, possibility thinking is just another word for faith. Now, wait a minute, you know that's false. You can be an atheist and teach positive thinking seminars. Jesus said in Mark 11, have faith in God. You better not have faith in anyone or anything else because it will all fail. And he said, I think the Bible is the foremost positive mental attitude book in the world. What are you going to say to that? And I said, I don't want to embarrass you on radio. Go ahead, he says. <laughs> well, well, I said, why don't you look it up in your Strong's Exhaustive Concordance? You won't find the word positive, you won't find the word mental, and you won't find the word attitude. Now, don't you think it's a bit odd that this book that you say is the foremost PMA, positive mental attitude book in the world, doesn't even know that concept? Where did it come from? Well, a guy named Napoleon Hill, and I don't want to get off track, but he got it from some demons. He says that he discovered that there was a temple of wisdom on the astral plane run by a school of masters and they'd been in touch with him and one of them came one evening across the astral plane in disembodied form manifested itself in his study and in a vibrant musical voice said you've been under the guidance of the great school for years and we have chosen you to give this teaching to the world what did he get PMA and he and another gentleman, W. Clement Stone, wrote uh, a positive mental attitude. That was where that thinking came from, it was from the demons. Deuteronomy 18, what does it say? If he says something and it doesn't happen, he's a false prophet too. We've got a lot of those today, and I won't try to name any more. We're running out of time. I haven't gotten to what I want to say. The God of prophecy. Uh, Isaiah 8.20. What does it say? To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. We've got all kinds of people running around claiming to be prophets, and they disagree with the word of God. Benny Hinn was on with Paul Crouch, and he said, Adam and Eve were the first supermen, superman, superwoman. While they could phew, zoom to the planets, they could swim underwater like the fish and not run out of breath. I try to find that in the Bible, you know. Uh, if they speak not according to this word, there's no light in them. Hey, where'd you get this idea? You didn't get it out of here. No. Jesus said, by their fruits you will know them, Matthew 7. It's another test. Uh, Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2 said, There were false prophets among the people, and so there will be among you. And they will teach damnable heresies. A false prophet comes up with heresies. You know, not according to this word, Isaiah 8.20 means, It's not what Paul said, the gospel of God. You can't trace it back to the prophets. It doesn't, it's not substantiated by the word of God. That's what he's saying. But this one says, it is contrary to the word of God. It's heresy. We live in a day when they don't like doctrine. Doctrine is the container of truth. And as I read my Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it says, Scripture is given by, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for, or it is to be used for what? Make you feel good about yourself, give you a high self-esteem, build up your self-image. Wow, isn't that a terrific book? <laughs> it says it's profitable for what? Doctrine. You got people who don't teach doctrine. They don't teach out of this book but they get it from somewhere else, you better beware. It's profitable for doctrine, what? Reproof, rebuke, correction, 
instruction in righteousness. In the next chapter, he says to Timothy, preach the word. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. It's a book for reproof. Well, what does prophecy talk about? Two great topics of prophecy. Israel and the church. We talked about it last night a bit. Israel. We don't have time. You know the scriptures. Begin back there with Genesis chapter 12. Trace it through and see what God says about Israel. He promised a land to Abram, right? He, prom he reiterated that promise to his son Isaac. He reiterated that promise to Jacob when he was down there with his head on a on a stone and he saw this vision of the angels ascending and descending and God said this land that you are lying on I will give to you and to your seed after you forever there are th several things that separate Israel from everybody else Th let's just take three of them the land did he promise the land to the church no we heard it last night we're we're promised mansions in the sky my father's house I'm going to prepare a place and I'm going to take you there but Israel is his earthly people. They are promised a land, and don't you try to take it away from them. And President Bush, don't you try to get them to give up some of that. And don't you try to stop this. Oh, you say, now wait a minute, come on, these guys. You mean to say they belong in that land? These wicked Jews, you know, they're New Agers, and they're rebels, and they're atheists, a lot of them. You mean to say they belong in that land? Yeah. Why? Because they're such wonderful people? No! No! Because God made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he will not break that promise. And they are there because of the promise that God made to their fathers, and because it is God's time to fulfill this. Now, that doesn't mean that everything Israel does is, is lily white. And we don't approve of everything they do. But that land belongs to them. You better be careful. Uh, and don't try to take it away from them. And the Arabs, they're finding that out. And they will find it out more thoroughly in the future. And they have, you would think that they would have learned their lesson by now. And then something else, the law. Turn to the Psalms. Psalm, if I can find it here somewhere. How about Psalm 147? <clears throat> Verse 19, he showeth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. He hath not so dealt with any nation, and as for his judgments, they have not known them, praise ye the Lord. The law was given by Moses to Israel. It was not given to Gentiles, and it was not given to the church. And don't you try let anybody put you back under the law. Oh, well, then we can do anything we uh, no, want. No, no, wait a minute. We got a higher law. The law of Christ. To live as he lived. To let him have his way in us. He who is led of the Spirit is not under the law. The fruit of the Spirit. Not the fruit of therapy, folks. Let's forget that one. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. You know the scriptures. And what does it say? Against such there is no law. Okay? The law was given to them. Oh, wait a minute now. The Sabbath. You better keep the Sabbath now. Uh, well, it tells us in Romans 2 that all of us, the Gentiles, have the law of God written in their conscience, right? Do you know of anybody who has keep the Sabbath written in their conscience? No! Never! You're only going to get that from the law of Moses. That was for them. They were God's earthly people. He rested on the seventh day from creating this old creation. We belong to the new creation. We wait for a new heavens and a new earth, Peter says, which God will bring forth. And that's why we worship the Lord on the eighth day, the first day of a new week when he rose from the dead because he was the firstborn of a new creation and we belong to him and we're in this new creation. And so it was on the first day of the week that the disciples came together to break bread. Paul tells you in 2 Corinthians, he says, on the first day of the week, lay up for you. That's when they took their offering and so forth and they laid up in store, etc. The law, the land, the law, and the presence of God. In... Uh, 
Exodus 34, Moses says, except your presence go with us, carry us not up hence. I'm not going to take one more step, Lord, until I know that your presence is with me. You ought to say that in your life. That house you're planning to buy, the business you're going to buy, whatever, your retirement, where you're going to move, whatever. You better say, Lord, until you really make it clear to me that this is your plan, I don't want to do this. And God says, my presence will go with you. And he says, I, and Moses says, then we will be separated from all the people on the earth in that your presence goes with us. And the presence of God was with them. And God protected them until they disobeyed, they rebelled, uh, disobeyed, they rebelled. And then they were scattered. As we mentioned last night, you can't explain it away, just like God said they would be scattered. 2,500 years all over the world remain an identifiable ethnic national uh, a group brought back to their land after 2,500 years since the Babylonian captivity. You can't explain that away. God said it would happen. It's a miracle, but not only that. He said he would make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. The whole world. Today, 5.2 billion people look at Jerusalem. They know that somehow you got to get peace over there that the next world war is going to break out over there. God said so. And yet Jerusalem was nothing. It was in ruins. And it lay in ruins for thousands, uh, for nearly, uh, well, two almost 2,000 years since the diaspora in AD uh, 70. Unlikely that it would happen. I was raised on prophecy. I remember in the 30s hearing the, the pre preachers, not dreaming it up, but saying it from the word of God, Israel will be back in her land. You can count on it because God said so. And today the whole world trembles for fear of what's going to happen over there, exactly as God says. You can't be an atheist. You begin to show these things to people. Open the scriptures and show them what God has said and then begin to tell them what God has said about the Messiah. You see, we'll have to come, come back to that. But they didn't know the prophecies. Judas didn't know the prophecies. If Judas had known the prophecies, it told what he would do. It even told his end. It told that he would commit suicide. It told he would betray for 30 pieces of silver. His greed, his avariciousness in which he worked out this deal with the Pharisees, he thought he was so clever. And he's going out there into the night now, and he's just all filled with, wow, what am I going to do with all I'm a rich man, you know, and so forth. It said, Zechariah said, 30 pieces of silver. And Zechariah even said what he would do with it. You're going to take it back in remorse and throw it down in the temple. And you know what? They're going to take it and buy a potter's field to bury strangers. All the details, everything that the rabbis did. And they laughed at him when he's on the cross. If you're the Messiah, what are you doing up there? Wait a minute, Psalm 22. They pierced my hands and my feet. The soldiers gambling for his, for his robe, exactly what it said. Parting his raiments, casting lots, giving him gall and vinegar to drink. You know, piercing my hands and my feet before the, uh, this was ever invented. The Roman Empire was here. We'll talk this afternoon about the Roman Empire and the part that it played when Christ came the first time in the part that it will play when he comes back again. It was there. It was laid out for them. Everything. They thought they were doing it. They thought they were proving that he was not the Messiah. And what do you know? They were fulfilling the scriptures that proved he was. Amazing. <clears throat> and God said to Israel, you are my witnesses. And he wanted them to be his witnesses, a nation that would demonstrate what God wanted a nation to be. And you know what? They rebelled, and they demonstrated that God is God because of his judgment upon them. And then he's brought them back. And they also became his witnesses because of what they did to the Messiah. It was prophesied that through Israel the Messiah would come, and that he would be despised and rejected. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, he's going to be led like a lamb to the slaughter, like a sheep before shears is dumb. Why was he dumb? Because he stood in our place and we had no answer to give. We were condemned. We were guilty. And he took that place for us. It's all in the prophets. I've run out of time. Study the Word of God. Study prophecy. Use it to convince the atheist. doesn't mean they all believe, but at least 
they will be responsible. Use it to encourage the faith of those who want to believe but don't really understand. Use this in preaching the gospel and then remember that God, he has a purpose and a plan for your life, for mine. We better follow his word. We better follow what the prophets have said. He will not do anything that he doesn't reveal it to the prophets, the scripture says. You want to know what's going to happen? Don't follow some Johnny-come-lately prophet, but read what the prophets have said, and you will know what God has done, what he's doing, what he will do, and you will see how it applies to your life. Father, take your word and make it real to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.